and he's also a role model for us in this pro in our program. He has uh, he has had an IMSD since 19 since some of before you most of you were born. Before it was IMSD. Yeah, uh, he's had an IMSD since 1984. Leah, where you born? 1990. There you go. <laughs> Alice, where you born? There you go. So I think most of you, uh, he's he's been he's been doing what we are doing here. Uh, you know. Well, that's enough of that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I don't want to age myself here too. Uh, the gray hair speaks for itself. So um, I I think. We do these because we normally want what the uh, uh, visiting scientists to talk about how they got into science, how he got so successful, how he's lasted six, 50 plus years doing it and looking so young. I think you all, Roberto, you need to you need to learn this. You know, this is what we do it. So it, it's not that stressful, you know. <laughs> and, and for him, I have to add that. Uh, uh, you know, he, he has two homes, so it's not that bad. You know, he has a home in New Jersey, he has another home in Iraq. <laughs> yeah, so, so you, can, you can be a scientist and still, all right, yes, yeah, sorry, you can do good things. I, I have a third home. <laughs> you do have a third home. Is that right? You see, Roberto, you got a third home. He's got a third home in Mexico, so I don't see you leaving a Baja, California. Yeah, there you go. So, um, the goal think, right now is for a first home, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the way we're going to do it today, because some of you came to his talk, his talk was really exciting. I mean, you guys, some of you were shy. You didn't show up. So <laughs> <laughs> you had to work. You had excuse, excuse. Yeah. Uh, in this Obama economy. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we're going to have you guys introduce yourself very quickly. What program you are associated with in our in our in our shop, and uh, where you're from, what you're studying. You know, just thirty seconds here, and we're going to start with our big man and that table. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm, I'm Sheldon Lawrence. Um, came from Hampton University undergrad. Um, currently, I'm working in Dr. John McDowell's lab in plant pathology and weed sciences, working with effector proteins um, and how they manipulate um, jasmonic acid and salicylic acid pathways in plants. What, what are those pathways? What do they do? Um, sal salicylic um, acid pathways. Oh, salicylic, okay. Pathways and jasmonic acid pathways. Um, there are two distinct pathways that are activated, um, some from pathogens and some from herbivores. So we're actually um, looking at the crosstalk between the two pathways to see if it induces the response in plant um, defenses or it actually decreases the response in plant, in plant uh, defenses. He's a great scholar, so you've seen him at our I don't think he wants to go to the us, right? <laughs> <laughs> We have a good botanist there. Do you really? <laughs> he wants to do genetics. I am genetics stuff. Good morning. My name is Jordan Booker. I'm a fourth year student in developmental and biological psychology. And I'm working with Julie Dunsmore in the social development lab, focusing a lot on emotion socialization and socio emotional competence in children and adolescents. So looking at how they can really relate to themselves and others. Things of that nature. And how it develops? Yep. Basically, I'm looking at at least a um, few different age points and how children are picking up different skills over time, um, and if they're having difficulties with like some uh, clinical setbacks, how they might be acting a little bit differently, how we can see how different treatments are working for these kids. Do you analyze the treatments? I assist um, with some actual diagnoses, um, with collaborating with the clinical lab, so I, I'm helping do some of the diagnostic work with them. Um, I'm not a clinician, but I, I help with some of their clinical diagnoses. So is, is it more than observational? Is it also interventional? Um, my lab's most, my home lab's mostly observational, and the uh, lab I'm collaborating with is mostly um, interventions and doing with the help of some of these children who are having some issues. Very interesting. Good. Okay, I'm Sherni Lee. <clears throat> I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. Fourth year PhD student in the genetics, bioinformatics, and conversational biology program, which we talked to yesterday. <laughs> Um, I work with Reinhard Lobenbacher. My background is in math, but my project is a split of uh, experimental biology and modeling. 
and also slight bioinformatics. Um, so I study our metabolism in the lung and how it changes with fungal infection. Is that is that descriptive of I mean, describing how how it how how the pathogen affects it? Or yes, I'm looking at the host side the and um, yeah, because the fungus specifically is Aspergillus fumigatus, so that has a requirement for iron, and then the host needs iron, so we're kind of looking at that interplay over iron between the cell and the fungus. But I model just the cell aspect. Bianca. I'm Bianca from Michi last night. Um, I am a doctoral candidate um, in the Department of Biology. I am focusing um, in the field of immunology, so I'm working with a lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. Um, and what we're doing is trying to determine the connection and the pathway between the mitochondria and our actual toll-like receptor response. Um, uh, which response? Uh, the toll-like pathway, the toll-like receptors. Yeah. yeah, so basically, yeah, um, yeah, so oh, those, new receptor? no, it's not a new receptor, that's the receptor, um, those are predominantly responsible for all of our inflammatory responses in our body, um, but it's not currently known what's the relationship between the mitochondria and our immune response, um, so that's what I'm studying. My name is Alicia, I did undergrad at Oakland University, I'm a prep scholar, and currently I'm working in an immunology lab, and the goal for, or the overall project of our lab is to cure staph, or staph RS induced mastitis and dairy cows. It, it, the goal is what? Um, to find a cure for, um, uh, against uh, staph, staph RS induced mastitis. Mastitis, mastitis mm -hmm. in cows. In cows? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's the approach that you're using? Okay, so my project, we are, look, we, we think that um, the main goal is to recruit neutrophils, which we think that will um, that will fight off the infection. So my project is focused on um, learning the mechanism to enhance that recruitment of neutrophils to the site of infection. How, how do you how can you activate the neutrophils? Activate the neutrophils. Is that the idea? To no, it's just to recruit them to, to the what? site. How do you how do how um, do you induce them? Yeah. You oh yeah, we them induce them. So there are certain specific cytokines that are. Um, produced by certain T cells, which allows for recruitment. So initially, we're looking to enhance these effective T cells, which will produce certain cytokines to attract the neutrophil to the site of infection. Yeah, my name is Roberto Padilla. I did my undergraduate at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. Um, I'm a second year graduate student here. I work in the Department of Chemistry under Dr. Karen J. Brewer. Um, I focus on the development of light activated anti cancer drugs. Um, so the goal is to have a drug that is non-toxic in the body or at the particular location of malignant cells. And then upon radiation with light, just basic light like this, you activate the molecule and it becomes toxic in the body. So, so how, do, how do you minister local light? I mean, uh, so I mean do you give a systemic, <coughs> systemic injection of the, of, the, of, the, of the agent and then direct the light to the tumor? Or uh, so what's well, the strategy? So the strategy is, so the new uh, direction where our drugs are going is actually to improve upon the delivery of the drug itself. So we're looking at uh, maybe modifying the architectural design of the molecule using maybe steroids, um, polypeptides, uh, polysaccharides and stuff like that to enhance the delivery of the drug to a particular location. Um, you can also directly inject the drug to the tumor itself and when you activate it, you use uh, uh, low energy uh, light. So you use uh, visible light to activate it. And red light from uh, 600 to around 800 nanometers penetrates the body fairly deeply and enough energy to produce those kind of toxic agents. So, so the idea is to get uh, to you have a, like a specific ligand for the tumor and then just use the jet light as general rather than having the, the, the uh, the agent general and light specific because I remember they, they, were, they were developing methods of uh, like for a thyroid tumor to direct the light uh, right at the uh, right through the neck or down the esophagus yeah so uh, uh, give the give the agent generally but then activate it locally by the light but this is a, you're talking about a different mm -hmm. different approach so we were trying to use the entire visible spectrum to actually activate through several uh, optical transitions that allow us to uh, generate some uh, electrons within the molecule and through intermolecular transitions, that's what activates the drug. So we could use, again, a simple light like now, and hopefully that will move us away from, you know, invasive uh, anti oh, chemotherapy and stuff like that. Yeah.
Um, I'm Sarah, and I'm a first year PhD student in genetics and genetics and computational biology. Um, I'm doing lab rotations right now, but the lab I'm finishing up with um, is Dr. Middleman, and he works with um, in cancer and um, with uh, repeats in DNA. And so uh, my project was developing a uh, cell assay to be able to um, detect whether these repeats are being shortened by drugs. Um, and it can be used to, um, I guess, find whether certain therapies are helping um, shorten the repeat, which could uh, cure Huntington's and Alzheimer's and things like that. But it's also directly applicable to cancer drugs. Um, the particular review we were looking at was CAG repeats, and at that particular website, it's for neurodegenerative disease. But it, um, once we are able to develop it in this repeat, we can look at other repeats as well. So, are the repeats uh, related to pathologies? Mm -hmm. Those are abnormal. So the repeats are abnormal, and, yeah, and the they're correlated with, with all these different uh, degenerative diseases. Yeah. In the, the locus on the DNA, um, it's normal for us to have repeats, but usually about 17 or so at this particular spot. Um, but in diseased patients, it's the repeats as long as like 98 or 200 repeats long. Um, and so if you can uh, shorten it to be closer to 17 or even 35, it can minimize the symptoms and also cure the disease. And what, what's supposed to produce the, the repeats? Are there? Uh, they happen that? through um, when they replicate DNA. Um, no, but I mean, is there some <clears throat> pathological cause for producing repeats? Um, I believe that when, um, like, th there's a genetic basis for uh, diseases like homologous. Um, and so I think what happens is that the homologous recombination pathway um, doesn't, it lacks the ability to recognize and fix the lengthening of the repeats, and so um, they, they become longer, faster than uh, the normal person. Mm -hmm. I think it's called trinucleotide repeat expansion. Uh, yeah. It's, um, it's, it also happens with that. <coughs> It's a very interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you know Mary Claire King in Seattle. She uh, she came to a family from Argentina. That's the first one I was telling you. So, <coughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyway, my next lab will be with working with breast cancer with Dr. Shevon, but most people here probably don't know Shevon, so you need to say what you are. <laughs> yes. Leah, <laughs> do you know Shevon? Yeah. Leah doesn't know Shevon. I speak to Shevon all the time. Do you really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, see. How about you, Terry? Sure. Terry, what are you talking about? Everyone knows her. I have a disclosure of hanging out with Dr. McNabb's dip sum luncheon. Okay. Mm. I'll still... You still do yeah. it for me. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, I am a Siobhan Bork, for those of you that have not had the pleasure of meeting me before. I'm an alumni of both the PrEP, uh, the UC PrEP and the UTI Institute program. I'm from Don't the get ideas now. We only, yeah. We're only doing one or two people. Yes. <laughs> um, I guess I'm a native of Newport News, Virginia. Um, I came to Virginia Tech through these programs and I finished up my PhD this past June in the Department of Biochemistry. I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Virginia Osteopathic uh, College of World. Edward via Virginia College of Osteopathic Medicine. VCOM. VCOM. <laughs> okay, it's right down the street with the CRC. <laughs> um, there you go. There you go. Um, that's in the Department of Pharmacology, and uh, I work for Dr. Beverly, Beverly Zygolinski, and she has a lot of different arms within her, her lab. Um, a lot of our funding comes from the Department of Defense, looking at traumatic brain injury and the use of nanoparticles as a potential uh, drug development, and persons who uh, are in harm's way or, or who, well, how do I want to put it, who get mild traumatic brain inter in 
injury all the time, for example, sports players, uh, athletes, or uh, veterans who come back from the war, you're looking at um, soldiers who are in harm's way, bombs and things like that. Um, and we also look at, um, again, the use of nanoparticles to treat uh, neuro neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So it's kind of these two arms and looking at nanoparticles to help um, two different kinds of, of people. So I kind of have my arms dipped into both of those things. So <coughs> it's pretty exciting research. Hi, I'm Nina. I'm really long last name. Labarat Nahiran. Um, and I'm a- Can you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Um, I'm a second year developmental and biological no, psychology exactly. graduate student. Um, I'm also a graduate student at the Virginia Tech Korean Research Institute. Um, doing um, interpersonal decision neuroscience um, with doctors Brooks King Cossus and Phil Chu. And um, we have, we're working on a few different projects, but um, my broad area of interest is in social functioning um, and how people make um, <coughs> social or decision, decisions in social contexts. Um, so, one of the areas I'm really interested in is risk. And, process, and how um, risk is processed in the brain, so the differentiation of uh, between social and non-social risks in the brain. Um, and we've been looking at, um, now that we've found that these pathways are different between um, social and non-social risk, we are actually looking in adolescence um, with one of our collaborators. Bye, guys. Dr. Daniel Catalito's lab in protein signaling. I'm looking at DBL protein and definitely specifically disheveled, disheveled two proteins. Okay. And it's um, part of the want um, uh, want frizzle uh, pathway to produce beta catheter to promote. It's a tram, tram, it's a factor for uh, gene proliferation for um, polar cell segregation. From my coach? Yeah. And I'm working with uh, how it interacts with known ligands <coughs> for change of conformation and what residues are affecting that change in conformation. And we're going to do um, mutagenesis on those res um, the residues that through um, NMR shows up that interact with it to see um, if we change those residues, how it affects the conformational changes and the binding to the um, known ligands. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, my name is Leah Guthrie. I'm a current prep scholar for undergrad. I went to Swarthmore College. And right now I'm working in a, mi in a microbiology lab where a big picture studying quorum sensing in Vibrio Paracutium Politicus. It's a C. Run that one past me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, VP Vibrio. It's, it's a Vibrio species. It's a seafood pathogen. Ooh, yeah. Okay. And um, so quorum sensing is just this idea of at a high cell density bacteria communicating together so that they all turn on the same genes at the same time. And we're interested in this pathway because virulence, how um, virulence factors and biofilm formation are all things that are controlled by quorum sensing. And so in Vibrio- you saying quorum sensing? Quorum yeah. sensing. What, what is that? So it's, it's just, I guess, as I said before, it's the idea that when these bacteria are together at a high cell density, they all communicate with each other so that they turn on the same genes mm -hmm. and they, um, and those same genes are regulated. And so at a large scale, you see, for example, for biofilms, bacteria form biofilms. And so when they're in a group, they all know to turn on the same genes to <coughs> form that biofilm, so to, to make those polysaccharides. And these, um, through quorum sensing, through this form of communication, they also turn on other genes relating to like type two or type four secretion systems where they can um, um, release virulent factors and things like that. Mm. And so in Vibrio, we found um, O4R, which is this protein that controls, regulates quorum sensing in that species, and we're trying to elucidate what it turns on first and figure out the steps in the cascade in the path pathway. And we're doing that using a lot of transcriptomics and um, RT-PCR to kind of map and look at the temporal expression of when things are getting turned on and what's being upregulated and what's not. Which seafood? Um, just <laughs> plants, just, fish, 
Yeah. Oh, it's and a, it's a, a var it's various a ones, not, various not, not ones specific. It's not specific. <laughs> <laughs> but it's specific to seafood. Well, yeah, it's found predominantly in seafood. Why? Um, why is it found? Well, why not in, in other in land land living? Well, yeah. I guess it's a so it's a halophile, so it likes to be oh, in so right. So okay. that's the reason for seafood. We've met before, um, but my name is Angela Diaz. I am an IMSB alumni, and I um, graduated. I got my PhD in May, yay, um, where my research focused on both the physiological and behavioral development of cognition and emotion in children, specifically um, infancy through middle childhood. Um, and currently, I am an IMSB program associate. Interviewed this week with Davidson. Yes, I did. For what? Uh, a faculty position. Oh, wonderful. So. Where? Um, Davidson you know, you College. Davidson, Davidson, Davidson North, North, Carolina. North Carolina. Where is that? Is it's it's in, that in, in, in North Carolina. Oh, it's in Davidson. <clears throat> oh. yeah. Very good small <clears throat> school. They have, they actually have some NIH money because yeah. we call, coordinate some training for. Uh, Undergraduate institutions around the country for microarrays for genomics. What? Yeah. It's in the shop. You wrote it in the MCC science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which, which yeah, I try to convince uh, Angelina to focus on them. <laughs> they are very they are into undergraduate education. They are one of the top schools in the country, and they they actually don't give loans anymore. <coughs> They don't need. To, they don't need to. Yeah, their endowment is huge. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket. I'm also <laughs> interested in getting postdocs. So I'm in the process of uh, applying to two, um, some fellowships for postdocs. So which department? Uh, would it, it be biology or psychology? Psychology department. Okay. okay. So my, my name is Terry, and I'm from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I was born and raised there. I'm actually a Virginia Tech graduate and now in the Baldwin Prep Program. I work in the same lab as my dear Bianca there. She's working there on the mitochondrial side of things, but I'm looking at the response through a different toll-like -like receptor, toll -like receptor seven and eight, because LPS acts primarily through TLR4, and our uh, PI is interested in seeing if um, the priming or getting these, uh, these pathways activated through a different toll -like receptor will have a different response. Mary? Um, my name is Marietta Hawk, and I'm a fourth year PhD student. I'm in the Department of Entomology, but most of my research is molecular biology focused, and I look at the mosquitoes that transmit dengue virus and yellow fever, and I'm looking at specifically um, a pathway called RNA interference, which is a gene regulation pathway, and in mosquitoes it's important in um, antiviral defense. And so what I'm doing is trying to determine the genes that are involved in that pathway, because most of what we know right now is based on fruit flies, and so I'm trying to see if the same situation is also occurring in the mosquitoes. Um, and so my research is really looking at the genes involved and also the protein-protein interactions occurring within the mosquito cells in infected and uninfected cells, looking at virus infection. Is that in infection of the mosquito? Infection, yes, and mosquitoes infected with the virus, because the mosquito, um, in order for the mosquito to be able to transmit a virus to us, it has the virus has to be able to infect them and not kill them. And so there's a very delicate balance in the mosquito with the immune system where it has to, the mosquito immune system has to keep the virus at a low enough infection that's not going to kill yeah. off the mosquito but still be able to be high enough to then be transmitted to us. What kind of parasite, the parasite virus? Yeah. Is that West Nile virus? Is um, it related to West Nile? Um, it's, dengue is a flavor <coughs> virus. But the pathway that I'm looking at is active with um, most viruses that are um, that infect the mosquito and, are, and then can be transmitted to us. So if you increase the virulence of the virus, will it kill the mosquitoes? Um, if the path, it, essentially yes, because we there have been studies I'm actually from my lab where um, if you knock down that pathway and the virus is able to replicate to such a high level, the mosquitoes die from it. So is that is that a would that be a treatment? I mean, would that be a strategy to uh, make them more virulent, it or would it make it more dangerous for It humans? has been considered to, well, it does not make it more dangerous to humans as far as we know. Um, and there are labs that have worked on using that pathway to essentially prime the mosquito's immune system 
against a virus so in that way the mosquitoes cannot be infected by the virus and therefore would not be able to transmit it to us. So there are work in, there is work including transgenics. Mm -hmm. that <coughs> He just came back from Colombia. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I went to the, uh, the Dengue conference in Colombia. It's yes, very important work that I'm great on. Uh, uh, do you know Frank? Um, Frank is what? Uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, he. I, I, don't remember, I don't know his last name. We Christian, had dinner yeah, yesterday. He's, in, but um, he's, uh, he's an sterilizing, sterilizing. Well, oh, you met Frank last night? Yeah. Oh. An interesting <laughs> strategy to uh, release. Uh, uh, release uh, genetically uh, modified uh -huh. males. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So he's in a yeah, he's in a different lab, but we're our labs collaborative on projects. Any more? Hi everyone, my name is Lee Mark Thorpe. I am the program manager No <laughs> <laughs> Program Manager for VT Prep and V Times D. And I went to school at North Carolina Central University and at Rapper University and now I'm here at JT. Do you know he's married to her? Yes. <laughs> I figured that out. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll hand you this over to uh, Anjali. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, as I uh, spoke to you before, um, we have this new initiative um, that we are um, calling um, Scientific Journeys, where we are trying to identify the different paths that an individual might go through to become a successful, successful scientist like mm -hmm. yourself. Um, so I would like if you could start off by telling me a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Uh, where did you go to high school and your schools? And what are you currently doing right now? And then I, of course, will interject. Okay. <laughs> well, I was born at a young age <laughs> in the Bronx, New York. And um, uh, my parents uh, were uh, immigrants. They came from, uh, my, my father came from the Ukraine, uh, and uh, my mother came from Poland. And um, uh, my, my mother made all the small decisions in the, in the family, like uh, uh, where we live, uh, what schools we go to, what we eat each day. And my father made all the big decisions, like uh, uh, how do we make world peace, and uh, <laughs> things like that. So, but he was a very, uh, he was a very uh, imaginative person. He, you know, he, he, he stimulated me, you know, he would look up in the sky and say, where does this all come from? And for, so I got, you know, he, he always uh, presented uh, these interesting things to me. Um, and I think that that got me started. And uh, when I went to college, I went to um, uh, Stuyvesant High School, which is a, a science, kind of a science high school in New York. And um, uh, one of my favorite courses was a, a physics course. I never took any biology in high school, but I took a physics course, and I, I, I like experimental physics. And I, I decided that uh, I wanted, when I went to college, I decided that uh, I, what I wanted to do was figure out how invisible forces act at a distance. That's what I wanted to do for, when I grow up. You know, like gravity and magnetism. How does it work? You know, these just pulling things together, and where's, where's, the, where's the force? Couldn't understand it, so I wanted to study that. And I took, so I took, um, I took physics courses in college, and I realized, and speaking with my friends there, that uh, uh, my phys physicist friends, that uh, it would just be mathematical descriptions of gravity and magnetism. It wouldn't really be, um, it wouldn't really be a, uh, I wouldn't get an intuitive grasp of it. I wanted a picture of what, what, uh, what, you know, how do these forces work? Uh, and so I decided that uh, uh, that put me into a blue funk. And, I, you know, I was, I was very disappointed. I didn't know what I was going to do when I grow up. And I, and I was thinking for, it took about a year uh, when I was really, really bad. I, could, I couldn't figure out what I, what I could do with my life. And then I, it occurred to me that another good question would be, um, how does a neuron produce a bit of awareness? You know, what, it's a bag of chemicals, and, but, but I know that we have conscious awareness. And what's the connection between, between neurons and awareness? So I decided that I'm going to study that. So uh, I got interested in, uh, in that. Uh, and um, I had an a interesting, it was just a chance opportunity that a, an old friend of mine was working at the Department of Animal Behavior which was in the American Museum of Natural History, on the top floor. I didn't know it existed, but I went up there. And uh, so I volunteered. I was working there as a, 
as a, uh, when I was a uh, junior in college, I was volunteering in the Department of Animal Behavior, studying stress behavior in rats. And, um, and then uh, my, my mentor there, Ethel Toback, suggested I take a course. I was, at, I, I, I was in City College. I, was, uh, I went to City College. Um, the reason I went to City College, well, actually, there, from Stuyvesant High School, I, had, um, I graduated in 1957. That was the year of Sputnik. The, you know, the, the Russian satellite that went up. And suddenly, the government said, oh, we need scientists and engineers in the country because we have to beat the Russians, <laughs> right? Because they beat us into space. We got to be, you know, we have to compete. And uh, which is something I'd like to come back to because it doesn't exist now. We don't have that kind of national uh, imperative. There's no national imperative now uh, for all of you, you know? And that's big difference. There's nothing pulling you into fields of science and, and, and engineering. You go, you, you're going in with your own motivation. And that was different, really, it, it, you, don't, you can't appreciate what a tremendous difference that is. Because when I graduated, when I was in, in your status, I felt that I have to become a scientist because you know, it's, it's a national imperative. And there are opportunities. There are all kinds of opportunities for me. You know, it, we, the, the government wants me. That's not, that's not true now. You know, I, you, you're facing a very different uh, problem. And I'm okay, can we can't be a government. It's, it, well, theoretically, but it's nothing, it's not the news every day. You know, when the, when, the, when the newspapers and, you know, the president is saying, we need scientists and engineers, it's nothing like that now. Then it, we needed scientists and engineers to beat the Russians. You know, everything was to beat the Russians. We, it was a, you know, it was a boogeyman. Um, so, um, and, and my science, adv science, well, my high school advisor uh, asked me, you know, the, we had advice. I guess you have advisors here too in science. But then I had a, about a five minute interview with my, uh, my career advisor in, in, in high school. And she said, uh, do you like math and science? I said, yeah. She said, well, then become an engineer. There's no, no question. So I actually started co uh, City College uh, as an engineer. Uh, and um, I, uh, uh, I was taking uh, engineering courses and, and science courses. I was taking physics and, and engineering. And I remember at one point, there was uh, uh, both uh, we, uh, exams. Were we was going to have an exam in both courses. And I remember my, my professor in engineering said, I don't, I don't care how you, how you solve the problem as long as you come up with the right answer. And at the same time, my physics professor said, in this upcoming exam, uh, I don't care if you come up with the right or wrong answer. I just want to know if you know how to do the problem. <laughs> and I said, I think I like that approach better. <laughs> so, that's, so I decided to become a, a scientist rather than an engineer because I thought it was more interesting. I didn't care so much about the right answer. I wanted to, was interested in how to do it. So, uh, so, that's, so I, I became a physicist. I, I started majoring in physics, and that's when I came up with the idea of, of uh, doing um, um, invisible forces. But then I, I got disillusioned with that, and then I decided uh, to uh, do, uh, the, um, get involved in how neurons produce awareness. Uh, and you know, like, what's the difference between a neuron producing pain and a neuron producing the color red? Uh, you know, questions like that. I thought it was really uh, kind of interesting and, and very puzzling. So when I was working, I was in, uh, working in the Museum of Natural History in the Department of Animal Behavior, and, and my, my uh, Ethel Toback, my mentor, suggested that I take a course with Danny Lehrman, who was a visiting professor at City College, uh, teaching a course in structure and function in the or of the organism. I took his course, and I loved the course because he was a, a brilliant lecturer. Uh, and, and everything went in and stuck. I, I didn't even have to take notes. Cause I just, it just clicked everything he was talking about. Because he was talking about the structure and function of the brain and behavior and, and why animals do things and what instinct is and how it's not really an explanation. All these things, very interesting. And at one point he was talking about some new research where uh, uh, Bob Lisk at, uh, at Princeton was uh, implanting uh, crystals of estrogen in the brain in rats and stimulating sex behavior. And I thought, that's really neat. You know, just because you, depending on where you put the crystals of estrogen, you get the behavior or you don't. And uh, I thought that's, I went up to him after the class and I said, that's really neat. 
And he said, uh, well, uh, how would you like to do that for your uh, doctoral dissertation with me? And I mean, that was an offer I couldn't refuse. So I became his graduate student, and that's what I did. I, I implanted uh, uh, crystals of progesterone in the brain of ring doves and stimulated their, uh, their reproductive behavior. And then uh, I, it, it occurred to me that uh, uh, what is what is the okay? So so hormone is stimulating the the behavior. It's stimulating neurons to do something. Uh, what? How does the hormone stimulate the neurons? Uh, and I, so I got interested in that question. And uh, the only person in the country who was doing anything like how hormones affect the nervous system was uh, Charles Sawyer at UCLA, the Brain Research Institute. So I went there. Uh, I got a I got a uh, I, I met him at a at a conference, um, uh, and. Um, uh, Danny Lehrman introduced me to him. I, I talked to him about what I'd like to do, and he said, okay, apply for a fellowship. I, I applied, I got a, a fellowship, an NIH fellowship. And um, um, so I did my postdoc with him. And he was doing, uh, studying this, as I mentioned yesterday in, in, in the seminar, uh, he was doing uh, uh, pseudo-pregnancy induction and studying how the brain controls hormone secretion in rats uh, with, with vaginal stimulation. That's how. So. That's how I, I got started doing, so I was recording, learned how to do recording of brain activity um, uh, and related to sensory stimulation and hormone administration. Won't go into those details. Um, so, and then um, Danny Lehrman, uh, before I left for the postdoc, he hired me, he, he said that he would give me a job when I got back on the faculty after my postdoc. So, and that was, a, again, an offer I couldn't refute. So I came back on the faculty after a year of postdoc and uh, we had a visitor, a visiting seminar speaker, James Olds, uh, who was famous for um, uh, the, uh, uh, finding the pleasure centers in the brain. And uh, he was studying, as I mentioned yesterday, he was studying um, how, uh, how, um, the, how neurons uh, are involved in, uh, in, in reinforcement and reward. He was studying learning, and he developed a method of recording the activity of single neurons in the awake rats, and he, was, he had them in automated boxes of learning, and he said, uh, he, told, he, said, he said to me that because I'm interested in behavior, could I come and, and observe his, all these rats uh, with their neuron, recording their neuron activity and see if there's any correlation between the neural activity and their behavior, and nobody had ever done that. Because of technology, there was no technology for that. He developed the technology, and um, uh, he. Uh, so I said, "Yeah, sure." That that was uh, that was the summer of 1967, and I went there, uh, and I was sitting and watching watching the rats and trying all different kinds of stimulation um, to see. Uh, you know, you, you sit, you can listen to the uh, action potential activity. Uh, and I was sitting, looking at the rats, watching, watching to see if uh, you know, like a hypothalamic neuron would be firing, and I'm trying to see if it's correlated with anything. And try giving it uh, chocolate and milk and vinegar and, and pinching the foot and, and vaginal <coughs> stimulation. And when I did the vaginal stimulation, they showed that response that I showed you yesterday that they became immobilized and they showed more doses. And uh, and also while I was watching them, I, I was noticing that there was an artifact of. Um, uh, that uh, it would go like that, and I looked, and I could see that it was correlated with the sniffing behavior. That as they, you know, as the rat was going like that with the whiskers, uh, there was activity in the brain that was synchronized with that, one to one. And I said that that's really interesting. And then I, I counted it and, and said it's, it was seven per second. I counted on the oscilloscope, and it's seven seven uh, uh, events per second. And I said that's the theta rhythm. And I was look, so I looked at the EEG of the animals, and it was showing that the, the sniffing behavior was synchronized. Each movement was synchronized with each wave of the theta theta wave. And I said that's really neat because it's an olfactory rhythm, and the the, the theta rhythm is an olfactory rhythm in the hippocampus and the, the whole olfactory system. Maybe there's something going on there. So uh, that I got all excited because I was I was seeing uh, it was the same night. It was it was a really strange night because this was a this was a uh, uh, an event in my life. This is a life event. This one night, I, made, I, I saw this synchrony between the theta rhythm and the sniffing behavior, and the immobilization uh, uh, by, the, by the vaginal stimulation. And I got all excited. I called my wife, 
in, who was in New Jersey, and um, she was pissed off because uh, why? You know, here I am with this. Uh, you know, I'm I'm all excited about this discovery, and there's the Newark riots going out, and she I can hear gunshots over the phone because it was it was the summer of '67, and New and we were living in Newark. And, and there was the, the riots going on in Newark. And you know, here I am with, this, with, with these two exciting discoveries, and, and, and my wife was angry at me because, uh, you know, what am I doing in Michigan? It was the University of Michigan. I, I, fi I failed to mention that. It was this is Ann Arbor, Mi University of Michigan. That's where Jim Olds had his lab. So I'm in Michigan, Ann, Ar Ann Arbor, and, um, and she's in Newark, and I, you know, scared of the gunshots, uh, seeing tanks in the streets. Um, and um, so, uh, and it was late at night, um, and I'm, I, so I, I finished speaking with her. I mean, there was nothing I could do. I was stuck here and, in, in Ann Arbor, and so I, I, I uh, and it was about, it was about 11 o'clock or mid, almost midnight. So I, I, I was all excited about these things. I got, I took my notebook and I went to the, uh, uh, I went to the, uh, I was hungry. I, I was uh, went to the cafeteria. The cafeteria was empty. And I'm telling you this for, there's a reason why I'm telling you this. Uh, so I sat down with my notebook and I'm writing, you know, about uh, immobilization produced by vaginal stimulation and lordosis in these animals and they all, at all stages of the estrous cycle and, and sniffing correlated with theta. And some guy came over to me and he said, hey buddy, look at the sign on the wall. And I, I, I looked at the sign, it says, uh, no, it is in the cafeteria. Uh, the sign said, there's no, uh, eating or drinking in the school cafeteria after midnight. And uh, the, the cafeteria is about the, a capacity of about 100, 400 people, and there's nobody there. It's after midnight, and I'm sitting there, so, you know, so, you know I have my sandwich, and, a, and a, I got a sandwich out of the machine and a, and a, and a drink, and the guy's saying, uh, you see that sign? And I say, yeah, but, you know, I'm not bothering anybody. He says, well, uh, you, you can't read or write in the school cafeteria after midnight. I said, oh, you know, that's ridiculous. There's nobody here. I'm not bothering anybody. And uh, so I, I, I sat there, and he sat down right in front of me. And he, I said, who, who are you? He said, I'm the night, I'm the night guard here. Uh, I said, well, you know, okay, but I'm not bothering anybody. And he's looking at me, and I'm, I have my pen and my notebook, and, and he's looking, watching me, and I got my pen, and... I was a caliber youth at the time, you know, and, and so I go like that, and he says, okay, buddy, and he gets up, and he goes over to the phone, and he calls the cops, and, and the cops came in about two minutes, and um, two cops, and they say, uh, uh, you're under arrest, so they, uh, <laughs> so, uh, they arrested me, um, they took me down to the uh, station house, uh, jostling me on the way to the uh, cop car. And uh, they, they, you know, had me sitting there for a, a few hours, and then they finally said, you know, what, what we, finally some cop came in and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I, I'm arrested for reading and writing in the school cafeteria after midnight. He looks at me, he said, <laughs> said, okay, we'll take you home. Uh, so they took me home, it's about four o'clock in the morning, and I, I was, you know, all excited, and uh, the next morning I, I called Jim Olds uh, uh, at about nine o'clock in the morning, and uh, I, I told him what happened, and he says, you're crazy, Barry. I said, why, what's the matter? He says, you don't mess around with Ann Arbor cops. They could have shot you. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so uh, I have an arrest record in my, uh, for, for my, from, for my uh, discoveries. Um, <laughs> reading and writing the school cafeteria. And I finally, I, you know, I, then I called the administration there, and I said, what, what, what kind of rule is that? And they said, well, you know, the library closes at midnight, and if, uh, if uh, we let you read and write in the school cafeteria, then everybody's going to want to come in out of the library and read or write in the school cafeteria after midnight. I said, no, I don't think so. But anyway, anyway, that was the reason for the for the sign for the rules. Anyway, so um, I let you keep your notes. Did I? Oh yeah, I kept my notes. <laughs> <laughs> my precious notes. So then, so then uh, I was uh, when I got back to back to my lab. Um, I, I decided to study both things, the, the uh, effect of vaginal stimulation and the, the sniffing behavior. And I, I, I was focusing on the sniffing behavior because I thought that, it was, that was really interesting because 
Uh, seven per second. I look. I looked also at the chewing and the licking. Do we? Are we running out of time? Or? No, we're talking about your mentors, right? Barry, it's less about your science. It's more about how you got into science. I'm well, I'm, I'm, tell, I'm telling you my, my decision points. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting uh, to so it. So I'm working on, working on the sniffing and the, because the sniffing, the, the, the chewing, it, there was, I looked at chewing and licking and sniffing, and they all go at seven per second, and I figured maybe this, maybe the theta rhythm is a pacemaker for, for all these oh. behaviors, like, uh, and they, they, they just lock into the different, so I had a whole theory, I wrote a whole, I, I wrote some theoretical papers on it, and I was all very interested in that, following up the, the sniffing behavior, uh, the theta rhythm, putting the, putting, and also trying to do the, the vaginal stimulation of lordosis and that stuff, uh, and it was getting to be overwhelming. I couldn't do both, because I, was, I was, had two different lines, two very different lines, and, um, and then my wife developed cancer, breast cancer, and she was getting sicker and sicker. We had two kids, and um, uh, I was taking care of the kids, and I was taking care of her, and, and at one point, there was a, another point, a moment of decision in my life, when uh, she was in the hospital in terrible pain, and I, I had found that, um, you know, I was still working on the sniffing, and I was still working on the, that by this time I had found that, that the, uh, the immobilization by the vaginal stimulation was, uh, had evidence in the rats that it was blocking pain. And my wife is, is in agony in the hospital, and I'm standing there looking at her, feeling, you know, completely helpless. I said, you know, look, dummy, I said to myself, look, you know, if you think you're so smart, why don't you do something useful? Instead of, instead of doing the sniffing behavior, why don't you do something useful and try, see if you can, if you think you're so smart, why don't you try to do something to block pain? Mm -hmm. So at that moment, I decided that I'm gonna drop the sniffing stuff and work, work on the pain, work on the pain blockage. So that's how I, I got, I focused on, on the pain blockage and the mechanism and trying to identify what the, what the pain blocking pathway is and what the substance is. Mm -hmm. And actually I collaborated with uh, 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 Frank Jordan, who was a colleague of mine in the chemistry department, um, to identify the substance. Oh, and we did, we did um, uh, identify a pain blocking substance. I didn't talk about it yesterday at the, uh, at the meeting, but, uh, uh, but uh, it turned out to be uh, uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide is released uh, by the vaginal stimulation, and uh, we, 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 he was a, uh, he's a uh, peptide physiologist, uh, chemist, uh, so we looked at different fragments, and we identified a fragment of VIP that uh, is very effective in blocking pain, and we patented it. Mm -hmm. So I got a, that was an interesting, uh, the, the, doing a patent is very different from publishing a, an article. You know, it's a very different process. It takes much longer. It took about five years from the time we started, we applied for it. You need a lawyer and funding from the university to, to do it. And, um, and they asked diff very different kinds of questions. Um, different from what you, kinds of questions you have to answer when you want to publish something. Uh, and, and in a way, it's much more trivial than, than publishing a, a research article, but it's more, much more detailed. You have to uh, show that uh, you, that this would nobody could predict that you would get this effect from from this molecule. Uh, you have to give, give all kinds of proofs of things, like stupid things like that. But anyway, um, so I continued working on that, and then um, uh, to try to figure, and then that's how I got into working with uh, humans because I wanted to know if it really blocks pain because I had all this uh, circumstantial evidence in rats, but you never really know if what you're doing is blocking pain in rats in any animal. So, you had a, so I figured uh, the most scientific answer I could get with all my fancy neurophysiological equipment, the, 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 the most, uh, the, the clearest and most definite scientific answer I could get would be to ask somebody if vaginal stimulation blocks pain. It definitely seems like you were interested in science from a, a very early on, your father sparking your, yeah. your interest. Yeah. Um, and was, then that physics class, it was so... Except that when I was really a young kid, I wanted to be a garbage collector. Because that was a very interesting... I liked, it, uh, first a garbage collector and then a, uh, a bus driver. Because I liked the way that they turn out. The <laughs> and they have the, the pilot lights blinking. On, you know, this is before digital, the digital age. You know, they had the pilot lights blinking on the, on the, on the steering wheel and the, and, and the signal. You know, I really, I really like that. So I want to be a bus driver. But, 
<laughs> but it seems to be very early on that you were interested in science, especially that that physics class was very influential to yeah, you. So you mentioned the physics. class being influential um, mm -hmm. to your decision. Was there any individuals, a, a teacher, or perhaps a, somebody who you consider a mentor that really influenced you, guided you a little bit? Well, um, um, I remember my math teacher in junior high. I remember one one event that that had. It, you know, it seems trivial, but it had a, a big impact on me. Um, she was very strict, a very good teacher, but very strict. And, and, and one time, one of the kids uh, dropped this pencil on the floor, and he leaned over and picked it up to pick it up. And she says, why are you doing that? Why aren't you paying attention? He says, I just want to pick up my pencil. And she said, the pencil will stay there. You pay attention to this. <laughs> and the pencil's not going anywhere. You have another pencil on your desk. Use, the, use that pencil. And that had an impact on me because you know, yeah, she's right. You know, it, it you know, certain things happen, and you can't, you, you don't have to deal with it right away. You know, there are other things that are more important. Anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about that. Never thought of that for a long time. Um, so that was that was in junior high. Um, the, uh, I guess, the, my most influential, um, well. Uh, in Stuyvesant High School, the physics course I took there was it was experimental physics, 